I would imagine that most of you in this room would find it extremely difficult to imagine life without computers. And I'd also be willing to bet that almost every one of you has a computer with you right now in the, in the form of your mobile phone. Um, so obviously, computers make a huge impact on, on how we live our daily lives. And into going to the future, I think it's very hard to predict how our lives will continue to be impacted. And there's one aspect um, of, uh, of daily life that I want to talk about today, which is personal memories, uh, in, in which I believe that this that our relationship to technology is um, going to change significantly. And by that I mean not only how we capture our personal memories, but how we manage them, how we store them, how we share them, and even how we pass, pass them on. So that's the topic of uh, my talk today. Whoops. Um, but here's an overview of the talk, and, and I want to spend the first uh, few minutes talking about um, a f my field, which is human-computer interaction. And I was just curious, how many of you in the audience have heard of that topic or that field before? HCI, human-computer interaction? Okay, not, not very many. That's, that's a bit sad. Um, so I think it's worth spending a, a little while just introducing you to what that's all about. So that's the first bit of the talk. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the, the topic of, of human memory, personal memories. Um, and one of the questions that I want to focus on there is the question of whether it's possible that we could capture every single experience um, that we have in our lives. And if we could store that in a computer, could we create something that's um, akin to an, an artificial memory or a backup brain? So that's, that's the topic of the middle part of the talk. And then at the very end, I want to talk about the issue of sharing and passing on our memories. So once we have all this personal data, what might we do with that in the future? And, and there are other um, topics come up, such as, well, what would we do with all that stuff when we die? Um, which is becoming more and more of a challenge. So human-computer interaction, well, what that, what's that all about? Well, this is a, a subfield of um, computer science, which actually is about the human perspective, okay? It's about the relationship between us and the technology that we use. And it's fundamentally a multidisciplinary subject. So you can become an HCI specialist um, by doing your first degree, not just in computer science or engineering, but you can also start from a design um, first degree. So you could do, for example, graphic design, industrial design, interaction design. Or you could start from the social sciences. So you could start from psychology, anthropology, sociology. And then you could go on to do a postgraduate degree in HCI a master's or a PhD um, degree, for example. Um, and even if you, you weren't interested in doing that, I think it's worth saying a bit about what the field's about, because in your careers in computer science, you may well end up working with um, some of us. So what are the goals of HCI? Well, one of the goals is to, as I said earlier, just to understand the, the relationship between people and technology, and, and understanding what happens at the intersection or at the interface between a person, a user, and a computer system. And also to understand what kinds of value people get from computer technology, right? What is it that they, they get? Do they get entertainment? Do they, are they made more efficient at work? Um, what, what, are, what are these issues and, and, and what is it about te technology that we find useful and valuable? The second goal is to attempt to design better technology by testing it with people. Um, so some of you may have heard of user testing before. That's, that's partly what this refer, refers to. So somebody might, um, or you might develop a prototype system or a colleague might, and they would give it to you to test. So you might put it in front of users in a laboratory situation and get them to use it and watch, watch people using it. Or you might put it out there in the real world, like in somebody's home or in the workplace, and then you would observe that. And then not only look at, um, does it get used in the way you expect it to be used, but other things that you could do to the design of the technology to make it better. And then the bit um, that I like the best, the goal that I, that I um, am most drawn to, is the, is the possibility of inventing new technologies, okay? So this is the creative bit. This is where you can study human behavior and get a sense of the things that people might want or might be drawn to in the future. So the invention bit um, is, is, is sort of the thing that Pull, often pulls in the designers as well, which is, which is quite fun. So where did HCI start? Well, this, this old chap was my PhD supervisor. His name's Don Norman. Um, and he it was a psychologist originally. 
Um, and when I joined his lab, uh, everybody in the lab was using Unix. And um, lots of us found Unix extremely difficult to use. It was kind of obtuse. The language was hard to understand. You could do things like type rm star, and it would get rid of absolutely everything in your directory without coming back to ask you if that was OK. Um, and Don wrote a, a little rant about it, actually, in a paper um, that he published, which upset the, the Unix hacker community at the time. But his argument was this. Computer systems shouldn't just be designed for computer scientists or Unix hackers. Computer systems should be designed so that everybody can use them. Um, and that was a radical idea back in the early 80s. And uh, following that, he and his research group uh, published this book called User-Centered System Design, which kind of made that case. And that kind of kicked off the field. And then just up the coast, so this is down in San Diego, up the coast at Xerox Park um, uh, in the Silicon Valley, um, Stu Card, Tom Moran, and Alan Newell, who were a bunch of psychologists and computer scientists, uh, wrote a book called The Psychology of Human-Computer Interaction. And what they were trying to do there was to say, well, we can model what goes on inside the user's head. We can model a user's behavior sitting in front of, a, let's say, a word processor on a computer system. And we can try and predict how uh, users will behave. So we can um, model almost like a, a series of keystrokes and mental activities if we know the task in the system. And if you do that, you can then predict how a user is going to interact with the system and you can also design more efficient user-friendly systems by changing the task and changing the system. So it's very much like seeing computer users as almost like uh, computer systems in themselves with all these subroutines and things going on inside their heads. And that worked quite well. And in fact, in the 80s and 90s, HCI, um, there were a number of achievements, a number of things, ways in which it impacted um, computer technology. So one is that. Um, one of the things that comes out of this is design is no longer simply in the hands of computer scientists and engineers. Just imagine if a computer science, scientist had designed your iPhone. I would uh, bet that it would look very different from the way it looks today. Um, also, usability testing, customer-centered design, user-friendliness, all of these terms sort of come out of this field. And most of the big IT companies today will have groups of people who will do this kind of thing, who will take take a new system, a new product, and test it to make sure that people can use it. Um, and finally, um, sorry, the, it, it's not enough anymore just to come up with a new technology and claim that it's better than somebody else's. You actually now ha would have to do a study to prove that it's faster or better or safer or, or, or whatever. Um, and, and back in the olden days, this wouldn't have happened. So HCI has done a lot of important things. But the problem is that um, HCI was sort of born and developed in the days of the personal computer. One person sitting in front of a desktop machine or a laptop machine. And we are not in that era anymore. We are no longer in the era of the personal computer. We're now in the era of what's called ubiquitous computing. Has anybody heard that term in this room? Hands up? OK. So this is sort of the the catchphrase now for within the computer science research world for a lot of things that we do. And that simply means that computers are now everywhere, but they're also um, often very much out of sight, OK? And they're, they're interconnected. As we know, they're often connected to the internet or to each other. So it's not as simple as it used to be in the old days of HCI. And this has a big impact on, on not only how we understand the relationship between people and technology, but also the kinds of questions we might ask in HCI. So let me try and give you an example. So w what is a computer th these days? I mean, it, it's actually, the, the answer is it can be many different things, OK? We can have computers in our running shoes now, which tell us how fast we run and how far we run. We can have them interwoven into the fibers of our clothing. We can have them embedded within us. So they are, you, um, there are now um, computers embedded within uh, um, devices which go into the cornea um, and help correct our eyesight. There are now sensors, um, and we're talking about computers that you can swallow that will help to diagnose your health or maybe deliver drugs at the right point in, in your body's system. Computers obviously are all over our houses already, right? They're in our TVs and our Xboxes, but they might also be in our washing machines and in our cars. 
There are lots of um, sort of interesting ideas that people have come up with for embedding computers in things like tablecloths and coffee cups. And of course, Microsoft Surface is a fancy interactive coffee table. So they're in our homes and they're everywhere. And actually seeing, seeing a computer and thinking that that's a computer um, is harder and harder to do. The other thing is that interacting with a computer is very different now, right? Uh, you can think of interacting with a computer as sitting down and getting your laptop out and turning it on, but you might be interacting with computers just by walking through a public space, right? You might not even know it, or you might not want to be interacting with a computer, but you might not have any control over that. So the, um, there's been a lot of talk about the amount of CCTV capture that goes on with us um, in daily life in the UK. Um, but there are also things like there are bathrooms now that when you use them, it will do urine analysis and saliva analysis and diagnose your health or how much you've been drinking or all of these other sorts of things. So the relationship between technology and how we interact with it is, can be very complex and a bit scary sometimes. Right. So the point I'm trying to make here is that the old models from HCI simply don't work. But actually, that makes this field much more exciting because we're starting to ask very different kinds of questions. Questions like, how will we know what digital resources are, are within us or all around us, and how do we design for that? How do we design systems to, let, to make people aware? What kinds of interaction techniques might we design when maybe there's no interface at all, right? Like the GUI metaphor was great for a desktop machine, but what if we can't see the interface? How do we design that? How do we design interaction with everyday objects like coffee cups. When we already have a set of everyday skills for dealing with these things, what if they've got computer chips in them? How do we deal with that and design for that? And issues like, which are more kind of ethical, how can the capture of information and the need for privacy be balanced through design? And that's something that I'll be touching on again in a minute. So let me um, talk more about some of these issues by, um, digging into this area now of personal memory as, as a kind of set of examples. Um, why is personal memory interesting? Well, the fact is we already use lots of different technologies to support our memories, right? Our memories, in general, human memory is not very good. It, it fails a lot of the time. We forget lots of things. We distort things um, that have happened to us in the past. Um, so it raises a question, well, if we can capture things about our lives, could we capture something about everything we experience in our lives. And if we could do that, could we create a kind of artificial brain? So if we could capture everything we ever see, everything we ever hear, every document we touch or create, every email or text that we send to each other, um, you know, all the ambient sound that goes on around us, would that then give us a complete record of our lives? Would it give us an, an artificial or prosthetic memory, just like you might have a prosthetic arm? Now, there are people who believe that this can be done. There are visionaries who believe that there's no reason we, could, we need to, to forget any aspect of anything we've done in our lives. Right? And they think that this is a great idea. This is something that we, sh we should be testing. This guy here, is, um, his name's Gordon Bell, and he's, he works for Microsoft Research in Silicon Valley. Um, and he is one of these people who is trying to record uh, something about everything he does in his, lives, his life. So he has every bit of paper he receives gets scanned in, everything he touches um, gets recorded, and he wears this little gizmo around his neck called a sense cam. And the, and the sense cam is essentially a wearable um, camera which takes a series of still photographs as he moves through his life. So I'll just show you a bit, bit more detail. This is what it looks like close up. So you wear it around your neck, and it sees things kind of from your point of view. And every time you move, or there's a change in the light or change in temperature, it takes a snapshot. And what ends up happening is at the end of the day, you've got hundreds and hundreds of images. Um, so let me show you a SenseCan movie. This was done by somebody in one of our studies. And he set it to music, just to give you a sense of what this might look like at the end of the day. This is one day.
Um, so that's SenseCam. And, and then the question is, well, if you had other kinds of ca capture devices and you had lots and lots of storage, could you capture everything? So um, just as comparison, we know that storage costs are coming way down, and uh, we know that the size of storage has come way down. So in, in 1970, 20 megabytes of, of storage might have cost you uh, $20,000. The prediction is by 2020, we could buy a terabyte of storage for uh, about the same as a cup of coffee. And a terabyte could store every single conversation you've ever had in your life. So the prediction is that, that by 2020, about $100 could probably buy you enough storage to, to store all of that, plus uh, thousands of video and millions and millions of photos. Um, so the question is, if you could do all that, could you give yourself an artificial memory? Well, this is one of the things that we were interested in sort of testing. So luckily we had SenseCam, we could use this for a study. And we did a study in which we had um, 19 um, people wear SenseCam for a couple of days. And then because some of us are psychologists, we like to do these kinds of tests. We got um, subsets of these images and we brought these people back in after three days, after 10 days, and after four months. And we showed them subsets of these images that they'd seen. And what we wanted to know is, if you see these images, can you recall what you were doing, right? Do these images help spark your memory for the everyday events uh, during which they were taken? And what you find, actually, is kind of interesting. What you find is that, yes, after three days, people can recall some of the things that were actually happening. They can recall the details of those events. But after 10 days and four months, the ability to, to recall those um, events goes straight almost down to zero, right? But what people can do is they can look at those images and they can figure out what they must have been doing. Now, no, this is a very different kind of thing. So if I see a picture of my friend and um, I'm sitting across from them and I can see my hands in the picture, I would know that I must have been having lunch with them. But I might not remember any details of that event. So what that's saying is, it's, what we're able to do with SenseCam is, is like a massive big database of the things that I had done in my life, but doesn't necessarily mean that I remember them, okay? So that's one thing to say. A second is in another study, we did, um, we had people wear sense cams time for a, a week. And when we got, when we interviewed people afterwards when they were looking at their images, they said things like, um, like on the left, it was a bit like being in a silent movie. I watched these things back um, and it made me look at things in a different way. Or one woman said, she got actually quite depressed. She said, well, I'm realizing how much of the time I spend in the car, doing the washing up, doing the cleaning. It sort of made her look at her life in, in a new way. And other people said, you know, I noticed things that I hadn't noticed before. Like I noticed strangers that I hadn't seen before. So it's not like, you're, not like the sense cam images are really your memory, right? They're actually making you reflect on your life in a different way. Other people did things like they strapped them onto kites. We had um, one person strap it onto their dog and to, to see life through a dog's eyes. Um, so they're doing lots of creative and interesting things with them, but it wasn't necessarily about memory. So the point that I want to make here is do these kinds of technologies really provide us with an artificial memory? Well, I would claim actually no. That you can't capture a human memory in a machine, right? The memories are in our head. What we're getting in the machines are, are, are cues that sometimes trigger memory and sometimes not. What they can do is provide us with a big personal database that we can go back and look things up that happened in our past, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're remembering them. And also, another interesting thing they can do is to help us reflect on things in a new way. So there are lots of really useful and compelling things we can do with these, with these kinds of technologies, but the claim that they actually give us an artificial memory, memory I would say, is uh, a bit misguided. So let me do the last bit of this talk. And, and here I want to talk about what's going to happen in the future. Because if we have all of this stuff, we have a problem, right? We have a problem in managing all of it, in, in kind of um, sorting it all out and filtering it and making it useful to us. Um, because a lot of what we capture is actually deliberate, right? We, all of us capture lots of photos and videos, especially now we have mobile phones that do all of that. Um, but also, um, some of our work has pointed out how important physical objects are, too, to us to connect to our past and to say something about our past lives. So one of the things we, we tried to do a couple of years ago is to put together a system that would help us 
um, capture and manage all of this digital stuff, but maybe we ask the question, what if we could also scan in physical things? And what if we could put it all together in some interesting way? So we built a, a system we call Family Archive. Uh, let's see. And this is it. It's a multi-touch surface. It's not a Microsoft surface. It's something we built um, specifically for this system. And the idea is that you might have one of these in your home. And here is a place where you could put all of your photos and videos, but also scan in physical objects and put them in boxes. Let me show you a, a, a brief video of this. So you just dock your, your camera, and stuff gets automatically uploaded to the system. And now you use a games engine, and you can play with the photos, manipulate them like you would kind of physical objects. You can display them and sort of order them if you want to and have a look at them that way. Um, but essentially what you do is store them in a virtual box, right? So you open up the box, and then you can kind of hoover up all the stuff that's sitting on the top of your archive, or just flick, flick things in. And if you want to get things out, you, you spill the box over. Um, and the other th here's, here's scanning and physical things. So if you put something underneath um, the overhead camera, you can now take a picture of that thing, and the image of that object uh, just gets dropped onto the surface as well. Things like postcards, souvenirs, things like, let's say you went to a concert, you might have the tickets, um, things like that. And that then gets um, dropped into the archive as well. And we put that in people's homes, and they actually had a lot of fun with it. In fact, one of the little kids in the, in the household scanned in all of his plastic dinosaurs. And um, he, would, he would put them in boxes, and uh, he would play with the virtual dinosaurs. Which, was, which he really loved. But then the, the parents would come and open up boxes of their photos and these dinosaurs would pop out and they weren't terribly pleased with that. Um, so it was a fun thing to do, but actually what people said to us, well, it's, well we don't, it doesn't let us manage things very well, right? It's kind of fiddly, all of this kind of opening boxes, spilling them out. It's really hard to, to manage things. And also we want to be more creative with the things that we have. Like we'd like to make scrapbooks, they said, and, and photo albums and that sort of thing. And we'd like more ways of sharing and displaying this. So we did a second system. And I have a very brief clip of it here. But if you want to see it in more detail, it's in the demo area at lunchtime. Um, so again, here you, there's an overhead um, camera here that, that might be in your kitchen that lets you drop objects in. And you can kind of triage those things. This is Microsoft Surface now. Um, drop the camera in and upload some um, images. You can tag them and sort of uh, delete them and so on. You can drag them onto photo displays that you might share sharing your home. You can go to a timeline view and look at all the stuff that you have. And you can also make scrapbooks. So here's a, a scrapbook where you can just drag and drop videos, um, things you've scanned in, and just make um, virtual albums out of it. So that um, is something we haven't put into households yet, um, but it's, it's kind of a direction we're going now. So the last topic I wanted to introduce is something called the digital footprint. Now, we've talked about photos and videos and all the things that we can capture that, that we might want to share. But in actual fact, in our daily lives, we leave a much bigger digital footprint. We leave lots of information about ourselves behind, whether we intend to or not, right? So this is not just all the documents and things that we might create on our PC, but it's all our Facebook postings, all our Twitter feeds, any emails we send and texts that we send. It might be things that we store up and into the cloud onto the network, like Flickr photos. Um, we have a huge trail of activities that we leave behind us. So a really interesting question is, well, what happens, what would happen if somebody really close to you died and left you all of this stuff, right? They left you their PC, but they maybe left you in charge of, of their Facebook account or their Twitter account. Um, that you got all of the stuff, all of the emails and things that they ever sent, and the text messages. What if you got their mobile phone? What would, what would you do with all of this stuff? And likewise, I know you're a bit young to think about shuffling off the mortal, mortal coil at this point, but what about when you die? What are you going to leave behind you? And um, how are the people that care about you Going to, going to deal with all of the things that you leave behind. And so these issues are really new issues for us as a society. And it's something that um, we started to think about and um, think about how we might design for that. So one of the um, guys in my group called Richard Banks, who's a senior designer, has started to think 
about these issues and to design some prototype technologies to, to try and deal with it. So there's three concepts here. I probably won't go through all of them, but um, they're interesting in that they're thinking of ways in which you might package up some of these materials, some, some of these things that come out of our digital footprints and package them up in such a way that you could leave them to, to for example, your children or give them to somebody that you care about um, in the future. So one um, is called Time Card. And what he's built here is a little box that you would use to honor somebody. So he's built one for his grandfather. Um, and what Time Card does is it allows you to load all of these materials, in this case about his granddad, um, into Time Card. And uh, let's see if I can run a little video here. Uh, there's no sound on this one. But he's got a, essentially um, a collage uh, of, of all of the materials that are about his grandfather. And his grandfather was a pilot in the Second World War. Um, and so he scanned in a lot of the old photos that he's inherited from his grandfather and essentially put them um, into this box. And not only the photos, but things like um, the certificate from the war. His, um, I think uh, there's also uh, newspaper clippings that his grandfather kept. And he's able to scan all of this in and kind of represent it in an interesting way. So what happens is you can, you can touch on these images. Well, there's, there's a clip about um, when his, his granddad died, I think, last year. Um, and by touching on it, you now get a timeline of all these events that comes up, um, which you can then use to kind of um, look back. Uh, and you can see that a lot of the stuff that his grandfather kept was around the wartime because that's the, the kind of era that um, meant the most to him. Um, oh, there's a telegraph in there. So lots of interesting stuff. And he's also done one for his um, daughter, which, um, who's only four at this point. But the point is that you can um, make these objects that sit in your home um, that are about honoring somebody. So that's one way that you might deal with some of these materials. But obviously, it takes a lot of time and effort to put these things together. Um, another idea that he had is this thing called Slide Viewer. And this is an old-fashioned um, gadget that we had back in the 70s where you could, you could put um, slides in this little box and look through. Um, let me just get this video going. Um, and what you get is, is essentially you get a, a box with a whole bunch of um, little plastic slides that allow you to access your Flickr account. So, if, as he says here, if a relative passes away, do you really want to take control of the Flickr account? Or is it the case that you'd just rather have all the pictures um, that they had posted? And so by creating this box that you would um, give to somebody or leave behind, um, you now have a way of packaging all of this up. So each of these little plastic slides here accesses uh, a different stack of photos on, on the Flickr account. And um, these might be stored locally in the box um, on a hard disk, or they might uh, just be accessed wirelessly. So um, by inserting one of these slides, which are just essentially plastic frames, you can now start to look at the digital images that come up. And the way he navigates through is he, he just tilts. Okay. So this is kind of a nice idea of putting uh, newfangled technology inside of old-fashioned stuff. And then the last one is um, it's called Backup Box. And here the idea is that you might um, package up all the Twitter feeds that you ever posted into a box. Um, and so again, it's a, it's, an, it's a nice physical object that lives in the home that you might leave behind, put on your mantelpiece, for example. Um, and essentially, if you open up the box, you can now browse through um, and look at all the, the posts that you made in the past. And there's no reason why you couldn't do this also with Facebook postings if you wanted. So this, these kinds of concepts um, do sort of open up. I think what, the, what they're good at doing is opening up the design space and making us think a bit differently about the digital stuff that we have. OK, so, so inside here, he's just got a timeline that you can now browse through um, and have a look at the, the tweets um, from the past just by pressing on them. Right, so have a look through. So that, 
um, is a third kind of concept. Now, I want to stress these are, all, these are not products we're building. These are concepts to help us think about the future and what it might look like and what kinds of things we might build. Right, so in the interest of time, because I know we're running a bit over, um, let me finish there. I, wanted, I hope what I've done is to try and make the point that in computer science, there are many ways of, um, of getting into the, into the field and many perspectives one can take. And one of these is the human perspective. And it's, um, it's a really interesting and rewarding career, as I'm speaking for myself personally. But I also think the thing that to realize is that we have lots of big issues and big questions about the way that technology will impact our lives. And there are, you know, we have choices to make, right? Whether technology is going to overwhelm us, is it going to burden us down? Um, are we going to be increasingly dependent on it? On a, are we going to, is it going to encroach on our privacy? Or do we design ways to, to deal with it and to control it and to make it more compelling and valuable to us? And I think, um, you know, you as a kind of next generation of people coming through, um, have, have those choices to make and could have, play a big role in this. So I encourage you to do that. Thanks. Oh, and um, one, one last thing. There, th we have, we have a, a little book about this called Being Human. So if you're interested in this field, there are some available outside, I believe. And you can pick that up and uh, have a read. It will tell you a lot more about human-computer interaction.